Welcome to Insights and Sound, where we talk to the people behind the scenes, behind the technology, and behind the music. People you may not know, but you should. And please check out getitinwriting.net forward slash shows for a full list of our podcasts and YouTube series. I'm here with composer Jeff Rona, and we are talking about the state of the art of music for film, TV, video games. It's a, it's a very, very broad topic, and we're going to cover it all in just 40 minutes. Because, or less. Yes, exactly. We could always just speed the whole thing up, you know. Yeah, it's good to see you again. Likewise, likewise. And we are in, uh, we are in your new studio, which is just an absolutely gorgeous space. I Thank really you so much. It. Not just from the decor, but it just, it feels yeah, like a well, creative vibe. It's really kind nice. of up here. We're in Los Angeles, but we're sort of, you know, tucked into this uh, corner of L.A. called Topanga Canyon, which is quiet and serene, and we're surrounded by nature and and um, it's nice to be able to start with a blank canvas when you sit down to think about sound and music so it's one of the nice things about about uh, working here versus all the studios I've had before that have been in tight urban uh, settings that's right your last one was sort of a basement uh, basement well, of a house. Was it wasn't basement. dingy or anything it wasn't mm -hmm. didn't feel like a basement but this is yeah Anyway, so your particular experience covers all these different genres. And one of the things we were talking about earlier before we started taping was the idea that there is no typical approach. Um, you know, John Williams would approach something completely differently than Danny Elfman, mm -hmm. you know. And so musically, there's no film music, typical film music per se. That's the way I look at it. You know, if I ask you, what does film music sound like? Who knows? There, there is no such thing as a genre called film music. But at the same time, there is an approach to cinematic composing that is actually quite rigorous and it's, it's very real. It's just that it, it can exist in so many different ways. It can exist in a traditional uh, orchestral form. It can exist in a contemporary, more more modern and ambient form, but still with orchestra. It can exist in a hybrid of orchestra and electronics. It can exist purely electronic. It can exist with arpeggios and more sort of pattern sequencer, uh, leitmotif-like uh, ide musical ideas, or some interesting combo. It can incorporate aspects of other forms of pop music. You know, you look at a composer like Nick Cave, uh, who is one of the brilliant modern film composers, but his approach with guitars and little else is utterly stunning. You know, I think regardless of what style a, a project, and by a project I'll be, I'm going to combine film, TV, and video games, and we'll just use the word project. Okay. Because most composers Fair. do and should move around as much as possible and feel comfortable in all three, even though each one has certain uh, unique aspects to it, and then there's, there's a certain amount of crossover. We, we What's can... the common thread? Well, the common thread is when you are learning how to write music for picture, that you adopt an approach that, it, that tells a story, tells the story, in a way that the filmmakers want, and at the same time leaves space and room for the audience to make up their own minds, to be able to focus on dialogue, to be able to enjoy the ride of the plot, of the characters, of the twists, without stepping on anybody's line in, in terms of dialogue. And there is that aspect of cinematic writing, even in video games, where if you fill every hole like in the concert world, you, your job, the job of a composer in the concert world is to hold an audience's attention, right? In a pop song, an artist's role is to hold the audience's attention every moment from the intro, the verses, the bridge, the chorus, whatever it is, you don't want 
people's minds to stray. But in film, in, in, in writing for film, TV, and games, you need to leave room for something else to, to coexist. So there's a, there's a simplicity, sometimes uh, a kind of a thinning out a little bit, and it, it's subtle and it comes and goes. There are moments when the music gets to step forward in an action scene, in a setup, in, the, you know, in an opening title. There are moments for the score to take over. But 80, 90% of the time, and you don't hear this in soundtrack albums because they've been re-edited. Of course. To take all of that underscore, and that's where the concept of underscore comes from. It is the score that comes under things like dialogue. So there are moments where the music can draw attention to itself, but ultimately one of the real skills that a composer has to build is the ability to hold the emotional character of a scene or a character uh, or even dialogue with, without distracting. And it's a challenge. It's a big responsibility. But, but what is the common thread? That is, to me, the common thread. It is, it is like the concerto with the soloist taken out. Mm. It, not to say that film music is purely accompaniment. It isn't. But it, there are certain times where it is a very normal thing, and I'm still guilty of it, uh, which is to overwrite in order to hold somebody's attention and to impress a producer or director. And often, as I'm writing, my last step is to find how many things I can take out uh -huh. at the very last moment. So I may, you know, a, a sketch may start on a piano or a string patch or something, you know, on my computer. Um, <clears throat> then I write, I build my themes, I build my, my, my palette of, of, of sound and orchestration. I'll write something to picture finally, and then the last thing I do is I go, what can I take out? And sometimes I take out that thing that was the initial spark. I might take out the original uh, part of the sketch. Sure. sure. Um, and uh, that's something that comes with, with a little more experience. So to me, the goal of, the, of composing for media, scoring for picture, is to create a world to tell a story and do it within certain constraints of what an audience, uh, any member of the audience can take in at one time. Yeah, it strikes me as a big responsibility in that you are, you want to add, but you want to stay out of the way. You want to, you want to enhance the visual, mm -hmm. but at the same time, you don't want to distract from. Right. The, because a lot goes into the visual, obviously, and you are, you're supporting that. Right. Well, it's quite rare that, you know, short of writing a musical, that, you know, the audience goes to see a movie because of the music. The music Maybe is Bollywood. there to enhance yeah. something else. And um, so, yeah, it, to me, it's, 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 it's a very subtle balance. And with every project you do and with every filmmaker you work with, uh, or game developer, you come up with a language that achieves that in a way that that particular project is happy with. So there isn't a set, it's not a line, you go, well, above that line, you're overwriting, below that, you're underwriting, and so you stay at the line. It's, it's going to be different with every person you collaborate with, because each collaboration is going to be with somebody who's going to say, well, I think this I think this movie could use a lot of music. And I think the music can really be loud and I think the music can really be bold. Maybe it's a project that doesn't have a, a lot of dialogue. You know, with video games, there may be no dialogue for long stretches of, of, of the game. So the opportunity, which by the way, doesn't always mean that a game needs the music to be loud. Mm -hmm. A lot of games have no music in key sections. Um, it's, all, it's all based on preference. And so, Part of that, part of every project is for a composer and the, uh, the creators of the project to decide, to decide. It's too complicated, it's too simple, it's too thematic, it's not thematic enough. I want, I want it to be highly melodic, I want it to be very uh, ambient. And you find, you find that happy place. So every project kind of has that happy place. But I think the concept of looking for that happy place is that constant thread that you asked about. And so essentially it's an, it's, it's an artistic collaboration just the same way 
being in a band is in terms of having to read each other, having to know where to leave spaces. Mm -hmm. But yet you've also got this visual component that is an additional challenge in a way. Yeah. You know, um, if you study music formally, one of the things you learn about is counterpoint, mm -hmm. right? Sure. The idea of different layers or elements of a piece of music coming in and out. Yes. And, and supporting each other, stepping, taking the front, taking the back, whatever it is. Not getting in each other's way. Right. Yeah. In, in scoring for media, part of the counterpoint, counterpoint of the music is the movie itself. Interesting perspective, yeah. Well, it's really, it's really important, and yeah. that, that gets back into the whole thing of the caution to overwrite. If you think of the dialogue as the melody, or a part of the melody, You're supporting it's that. completely going to change how you view any melodic aspects of, or thematic aspects of the music itself. If you've decided on a style that's highly repetitive, if you've decided on a style that's highly melodic and through written, all of this will get influenced by the pace of the, of this, of the picture, of the media, the pace of it, the drive of it, you know, the, the importance of, of a moment of dialogue that is key to the plot. So these all enter into it. And the more aware of, of that interplay you can be, I think the better your chances of creating something that will be a really successful collaboration. So needless to say, a very good intrinsic understanding of the filmmaking process is also kind of an essential tool. Well, I think a good director will point out these, these critical moments, you know, mm -hmm. where something musical has to either step in to say something or step out to let something be understood. So, you know, you take an action scene. So, number one, there's going to be a lot of sound effects, right. probably. Right. Whatever it is, you know, shooting, car chases, airplanes, whatever right. it is. Um, and yet, you have, within the, the chaos and mayhem of an action scene, you have moments where the bad guy is ahead, the good guy is behind, the good guy, you know, mm. gets, gets a lick in, but then you know, doesn't. So what holds the audience's attention in an action scene isn't that it goes well, it's that it doesn't go well, right? Although, you know, if it's a foregone conclusion that the good guy's going to win, well, why, why bother to stick around? Yeah. So um, musically, you're in that position of supporting the undertext of, of, of the cat and mouse, uh, of a chase, uh, the cat and mouse of a battle, uh, of a crime, of of the bad guy getting 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 one up on on the good guy, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. So, again, music has the job of supporting that and saying, ah, well, now 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 things aren't going so well for our hero. You know, let's 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 play up the villain, uh, and and that may go back and forth. So. There's a wonderful way to have that interplay. You might involve key changes or other forms of rhythmic modulation to indicate, uh, to kind of add structure and form to what may just seem on the screen as something very chaotic, but it really isn't. It's, these things are usually extraordinarily choreographed and well thought out, even though the result on the screen is like, oh my God, right? It's just, it's just coming at you so fast. So musically, you can, you can be very supportive of the filmmaker's intent of saying, well, I don't want the audience to know that the, that the villain is standing outside the building, so let's keep it, let's keep it kind of, the hero's doing fine, and so that it, we don't telegraph or, or you know, foreshadow uh, what's happening. So there's a psychological aspect to not necessarily scoring what's directly on the screen, but what's going through the mind of the hero, what's going through the mind of the villain, uh, who's, who's ahead, who's behind, who, who pulls out a sudden surprise, things like that. So how much input do you, or, or again, is this something that's completely different with every project, but how much input do you actually get from the director? It's highly variable. Is it? Um, because you're starting with a completely blank canvas to a certain extent, really. and yet you're not. Not really. 
You know, um, any good filmmaker or video game developer loves music. Music is just something that directors and producers and picture editors and game developers love. Mm -hmm. So when they're working on the project, well before they've brought a composer on board to create the soundtrack to that project, they probably already have quite a bit, not probably, they, they have ideas uh -huh. about music based on things they've heard that they love. That reminds them of the feeling that they hope will exist in the project at hand, right? Mm, okay. So by the time a composer gets involved, your, your collaborators, whoever, the people you're working for, have already thrown ideas into the, into the mix. It might be that it's the, the temp music that the editors have been cutting in to a film or TV project, uh, or, or soundtracks that are thrown into um, video game uh, works in progress where they're just rendering uh, scenes since you're not working to a, a set thing in the game right. it's real time but they they'll they'll when you when you work on a game they'll output a few minutes of a, of a battle or a scene or a, a tension moment or a, an explore an exploration uh, scene and they may throw some music into that because they they think well you know what slow really works okay you know drones really work uh, a slow melody really works uh, so they're giving you a sort of a something like this inspiration kind of thing to work for. Yeah, and some composers embrace that and some hate it. Uh -huh. You know, nobody wants to be told what to do. Yeah, I, I would mean, think that would you be... hired me to compose, not to be yeah. a musical secretary. Uh -huh. And and the answer is that uh, it it's somewhere in between. Uh -huh. You don't you rarely if ever start from zero. Um, and a good a good filmmaker will give a composer freedom within defined expectations. So for you coming into a project, you, you sort of already have something mapped out, but yet obviously you want to be as original as possible. You want mm -hmm. to be as inspired as possible. Is that, a, is that a conflict? Is it a dichotomy in a sense? I think if you work with people who are confident about the material, you get a lot more freedom. Mm -hmm. If they're nervous that they're not, they haven't created something uh, of great value, then they may express that in the form of, uh, of additional micromanagement. Which can't be fun. You know, you can't win them all. Yeah. But ultimately, every project starts with a conversation between the creative parties. Of course. So that's a composer, filmmaker, a showrunner, an audio director from a, from a game uh, project, and, and then any ancillary people who matter, um, which can be bewildering sometimes, and sometimes <laughs> it really comes down to these very focused uh, relationships with one-on-one -on -one or you know, two or three. Mm -hmm. So, um, those conversations are the most important part of it. So there may be temp music, there may not be. But when you sit down before you've written note one and they say, well, you know, I really love the music of Ryuichi Sakamoto or I really love the music of Tom Newman or Danny Elfman or mm -hmm. whoever, it doesn't matter. But I don't, want, I don't want this to sound like that. You know, I like their use of cellos. I like their use of... of Asian percussion, but do you do you? Uh -huh. um, those those are the good jobs, and those are the kinds of conversations that really spark the beginnings of, of a project. I think mm -hmm. where you might listen to music together, uh, you may go back through some of your old, you know, the composer may go through some of their old their old projects. Uh, a director might say, you know, I really like that score you did for such and such, or you might just be listening to. Spotify and YouTube and going, you know, here's some really interesting Japanese traditional music or, you know, Balkan music or here's some punk rock from, you know, from the 70s and whatever, whatever your inspiration is, um, having that conversation and starting to build a rapport before you start writing, I think often answers questions, although, 
as has you know, been famously said many times, it's very difficult to articulate the nature of music verbally. Dancing about architecture. Dancing about architecture. Yep. So to whatever degree a filmmaker is capable of describing what it is they love about a piece of music or what their musical expectations are to, to you, great. But whatever they don't, you take a shot and maybe it's a shot in the dark. Sometimes you win, sometimes it begats a conversation and, and you go from that conversation. Sure, it's the creative process. It's a back and forth between a, you know, a mm -hmm. composer, a music maker, an artist, and the person that they're working with to say, could it be a little more this? Could it be a little less that? I mm -hmm. like this part, I didn't like that part. Sure. And then you have, you have a process. And if you're, if you're a good composer and you're sensitive and you're a good listener, if you're a really good listener, you can usually get it within, if not the first try, within a couple. Yeah, makes sense. And then, and then you're kind of off to the races, mm -hmm. sort of. So, as you said earlier, there are, each project is completely different. But in terms of common threads and common delineations, Let's talk a little bit about the difference between scoring to picture with a plot-based linear mm -hmm. movie, TV show, whatever, as opposed to something like games where you're, you're, you're scoring a short scenario and especially a scenario that could come in any particular order. Mm -hmm. um, it's a good question. It's a really good question. It's one that took me a long time to learn, you know? I had already been scoring film and TV for a long time before I got more deeply into scoring video games. And the first couple of games I did, I didn't take advantage of what the world of video games offer a composer creatively. But, um, you know, in terms of writing music for, for film or TV, it's linear, it's been edited, you are writing to a fixed piece of story. You have a piece, you have a scene, and you're gonna score the scene. The scene is a minute and 37 seconds long. At these moments, things may happen that may cause the music to wanna to shift or pause or take a breath or, or modulate in some way, but it's fixed. The structure of the music is sort of literary. It is based on, on assisting the telling of the story in real time over that minute and 37 seconds. And you just, you just write it. You, you often will sort of sneak your way in so you don't draw too much attention to yourself, depending on the nature of it. Sometimes if it's a transitional moment, you can kind of just come in, but often you kind of work your way into a scene. Same thing, you may, you may want to wrap that cue up by resolving the scene and saying, okay, there's an ending. Most film uh, and TV music usually res doesn't resolve at the end. A lot of fade ins and fade outs. It's, it's, yeah. There's fading in, there's fading out. Mm -hmm. um, not, not always, but it's, it's frequent. And in terms of ending, you don't necessarily resolve like you would a pop song where you kind of go back to the, your tonic and you sort of wrap it up and uh -huh. you know, f finish. The music kind of, leaves you hanging a little bit so that it, it brings you to the next scene and the next scene and the next scene. So music, one of the ways music propels a story is to say it's not over until the movie's over. Uh -huh. So you'll notice if you listen to film music, it's quite rare, not never, but that it's fairly rare that any one cue within the middle of, of from the beginning till the, before the end, that it resolves in a way that's sort of musically satisfying, you know, mm -hmm. five, one. Not, not a typical thing to do for, for dramatic purpose, and it's right. actually pretty great. Right. Um, with video games, there is no given length to a moment in a game. So a game is a series of cells that are interconnected and interrelated, each having a musical need but not having a musical uh, structure. Okay. There's an exception to that, what are called cutscenes or cinematics, where there are transitional moments in a game, which are in essence short films. Mm -hmm. You know, something that sets up 
a scene that sets up a murder and then you're so out to solve the murder, that sets up a world and then you're dropped into the world, uh, or transitional moments at the end of those things that take you to the next level, the next scene, the next problem. Um, those are scored kind of like short films in a way. Um, but in terms of writing music for interactivity, that is, for a player who is trying to get to a particular goal, and that goal is to, you know, get hit a score, to solve a problem, to solve a puzzle, to kill a certain number of enemies, whatever mm -hmm. it is. Mm -hmm. The music needs to hold, hold a certain level of energy without getting boring. You know, if you just write a piece of music that's just at 11 for an indefinite period of time, you're just going to nod off. You're, you eventually, it just turns into sure. uh, soup. So the ability for a piece of music to modulate and come, come and, and hit moments, retreat kind of, like, kind of like it would in a film, in an action scene in a film, where you know, the music is modulating up and down, it's change, perhaps it's changing key, it's changing energy, rhythms are coming in, rhythms are coming out, melodies are coming in, melodies are coming out. In the world of games, you write these pieces of, of music which have the ability for elements to come in and out based on play, to do it organically, to build in transitions in and out of moments of expanded or diminished energy, um, all because of your knowledge of how that music is deployed technically in a game. So uh -huh. unlike uh, in, in a film, you know, you write the music, you mix the music, you hand the music over, uh, you'll give them stems so you have the different elements on different channels of your mix and they may, as they're mixing the movie, they may decide, oh, let's bring up, you know, the percussion here, bring the melody down here, even take it out mm -hmm. for a period of time because it's, it's overwhelming uh, dialogue. In a game, you give the, the, the game's engine all of these ca capabilities through writing your music in this highly modular fashion. So it's modular both in time and it's modular in its depth. So and even, in, even in parts, you give stems to the game so, developers so as well. More stems in a game often than there are in, in a film mix. That would make sense. With the exception of mobile games where they're really trying to be very conservative with um, limited CPU and memory. Right. Um, console games, PC games often have a lot of interactivity because of the modularity of the music. So, so you write the music with many possible intros, many possible endings, um, many possibilities for modulation within it, um, and those might exist on different stems. A stem may come in um, at the beginning of a melody, it may step in in the middle of a melody, um, you have ways of, of bringing rhythmic ideas in and out to bring the energy up, up and down. And it all happens because you as a composer understand what the video, what that, what that scene in the game, that level of the game is capable of. Well, there are these different kinds of enemies. There are different kinds of opportunities. You, there might be a place where you can charge up your power again and you're gonna write something musically that kind of takes you into that uh -huh. and allows for that. Um, so there's this modularity to the writing in, in most cases. Again, just like there's no one way of scoring a scene in a movie, there's no one way of scoring a game. In fact, I've, I, it's been my experience that there's far more variability in the requests put on a composer in the game world than there is in the film and TV world. Well, it makes sense. Every game uses, either uses different technology or uses the available technology differently. But what's really key is that as a composer, you find out from those game, from your, your collaborators in the, in the audio department for that game, <clears throat> what are my possibilities? What can, what, am, what can I do? Can I write music that can go for three minutes before it loops back around? Or do I have to keep it to 30 seconds to conserve memory? Mm -hmm. Within those 30 seconds, can I have different endings? Do I have to go all the way back to the beginning or can I jump to somewhere in the middle? Or do I have to go all the way to the end or can I jump back somewhere before the end? Can I have a crossfade to cover up <clears throat> a cymbal roll or, or, a, or the reverb of a drum? You know, can I, 
How many stems can I have? Can I have the melody on two stems? Can I have an A theme and a B theme? Can I have two or three or four different melodies in this one section? One that's more dark, one that's more heroic. Um, all of these are, these are all options on the table. Sounds super modular. It's super modular. Yeah, and like I yeah. say, it's modular in time. You may be writing lots of short pieces, mm -hmm. a fewer number of bigger pieces, transitional elements. Um, it's not unusual to have one piece of music that's at one tempo and one key, but have dozens of breaks at which point in the mix and it, when they implement it into the game and, and install it into the interactive software that plays the music back, um, dozens of break points where the music could jump, <clears throat> jump in, jump back, uh, whatever. To virtually anywhere else in that sense. Whatever makes sense. Yeah, it, I mean, it isn't anything to anything, uh -huh. but um, you know, uh, it might be that I write a 32 bar piece and that functions as a loopable piece. And then I create a two bar, two, several two bar iterations of the ending of that. And you can jump to either, any one of those uh -huh, and see. then jump forward or jump back. Mm -hmm. So um, you become hyper aware in game writing about transitions, uh, about variations and a, a unique set of tools that allow you to hold the audience's interest. Now, one thing that fascinates me, and this is this is with obviously with any form of scoring, is I love the fact that you are not at all bound to genres, bound to even combinations of instrumentation. I mean, you can get away with a hell of a lot more than you can in pop music. Now that can be good or bad, I assume, but... No, you, you bring up a good point. Um, you know, the, the pop music world is broad but fairly formulaic. For, yes. Uh, record labels are looking for hooks, they're looking for certain structure, they're looking for certain lyrics. Um, the pop world is fairly well defined. There are mavericks who break out of it and we applaud them, we laud them, you know, they, mm -hmm. they get a seat at the table. Just but doesn't happen they, a lot. And, and even they are still formulaic within certain boundaries. To some extent, sure. You know, there, it's, gotta be, it's got to be an earworm quote unquote, yeah. in order to be a pop success of any kind. And that I don't think is true at all in terms of scoring. I find that um, scoring for media, the people that you work with, the producers, the directors, the game devs, the audio directors, are looking for music that has personality and is memorable. Whether that memorable Boldness, memorability. Memorability comes from something melodic, you know, a melody, a theme, or something that can occur over and over again within yeah. the body of a, of a score. Mm -hmm. Something cohesive that is memorable. Uh, that, that, that remains highly desirable. So just like that would be true in a pop song, except in a pop song it's usually like three to six seconds, in a, in a game or in a movie, that can, it can be a much more developed thing. And it doesn't have to be melodic. It can be a hooky little, little repetitive synth figure. It can mm -hmm. be a hooky little repetitive string figure. But it's a motif of some sort. But something motivic yeah. or melodic or uh -huh. rhythmic uh, or sonic that keeps coming back and you go, ah, this really belongs in this world. Uh -huh. So in that regard, I don't think anything is different. You know, as a composer, you're, you're, you're used to thinking about all the minutia of producing music. You're thinking about all the technology, all the sounds, the plugins, you know, the, the effects, the, the possibility, the creative possibilities of using technology. You have to remember that the people you're working for don't think about any of that. Of course. They're, they are looking for one thing and one thing only, which is what we do as composers, which is we create experiences. So they're in the business of creating experiences. We are in the position of creating soundtracks that assist them in creating experiences. And those experiences are emotional experiences and not um, 
academic experiences or intellectual rather experiences. Scoring for pictures is about creating feelings and emotions even in a piece of material that might be very thoughtful, you know? Mm -hmm. Something where you have to kind of think because there's something intellectual going on, you know, a whodunit, uh, or just something very, very thoughtfully written and, and, and created. It is typically our job to be very emotional and, and do it with as much economy and simplicity as possible. So, in regards to creating something that is unique, that hasn't been done before, but that is memorable and fulfills the needs of that project, whatever it is. When you're working on a soundtrack, you absolutely have far more latitude for, for coming up with creating that sonic world. If you're writing for orchestra, you have a near infinite number of possibilities. An orchestra can be very, very uh, melodic, it can be very traditional, it can be very romantic, it can be very classical. It can be very atonal too. And it can also be very textural, mm -hmm. ambient, <clears throat> moody, and anything in between. Sure. Orchestras definitely bring something unique that electronics don't bring and vice versa. And I don't think it's one is better than the other. They, they, have, they still remain very different from one another. But there's no question that we get to be, we get a much bigger sandbox to play in, in scoring than you do in writing for the pop world. Uh, the concert world, you know, for cla quote unquote classical uh, comp composition, that's a different sandbox altogether. And sure. in my view, that's often much more intellectual than what we do. Even though we're writing for some of the same instruments and using some of the same unusual techniques in some cases and having to learn the rigors of orchestration and extended string techniques and wind techniques and, and, and what have you. Um, but it's more cerebral, I think, isn't it? Cerebral is what I would consider concert music. Yeah, Absolutely. that's what I'm saying. No, yeah. what mm -hmm. we do is far more subtle in, mm -hmm. in, my, in my mind, in my experience, in my world. I think the, 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 if, if, you're, if you need to explain yourself to a director and you say, well, you know, I took that melody and I played it backwards and I, I, I reharmonized it using these odd pentatonic scales. If you have to explain why a piece of music should work uh, emotionally in a scene, you have... You've lost. You've, you've failed. Yeah. With some exceptions, you know. You might say, look, I'm going to have... A, there's going to be a theme at the beginning of the movie, which I am going to reverse and play backwards at the end as a bookend, the audience may not pick up on it, but I want you to know that for me, that was a creative tool that I think adds something truly unique to the nature of, of the score. And emotionally, everything I'm going to do is going to fit, but we're going to do this interesting little conceptual idea. There's nothing wrong with having a concept. And it can be a high concept. It can be something that is a little highbrow, but at the end of the day, if it doesn't just work as music, as sound and picture, that's, that's, not going, that's not going to fly. But it's not that unusual to say, well, I'm going to use the sound of a ticking clock, and I'm going to write a score around the sound of a ticking clock. And that can get you as a composer kind of excited and get going, but at some point, you're also going to have to write something that has nothing to do with that. Sure, of course. But as you say, you can mingle genres. You can mingle electronic and mm -hmm. traditional instruments. You can, yeah. you can bring in all sorts of ethnic combinations of instruments that, that hardly exist in the real world. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can do things that are impossible to perform. Yeah. You don't have to worry about life performance mm -hmm. as you know pop musicians do mm -hmm. you know even if they're working with pre-recorded backing tracks they're still making sure that it's performable in one way or another um we get to have a lot of fun Sounds at the like end of it. the day it's important to realize that although you may begin with all the colors in the in the crayon box a good piece of music is probably going to focus on 
a tiny handful of your favorite colors and not try to fill in everything in everything you do. I think it's really, it, it's so vital for artists, whether you're a painter, a novelist, a screenwriter, a composer, whatever it is, to say, you know what, I, I'm starting from the perspective of anything goes, but when I actually sit down to make that painting, to write that novel, it's these six crayons that I'm going to use. I've tried them all, I've experimented, and I may grab that one crayon and, and squiggle something in the corner, but ultimately, a good piece of art is where an artist says, this is what I've decided to not do. Well, it's been said that a big part of the creative process is whittling away, taking things away. You know, that you can liken it to the idea of a sculpture. Yeah. You know, where you start with a block and you remove. Yeah, it's reductive. Remove. Absolutely. Well, yes. as, as a composer, a lot of my job is to be that sort of filter to say, well, you know what? I kind of like this piece that I've written for this scene, but it's not, it doesn't fit the rest of the score. It doesn't fit that character's uh, thought process. And mm -hmm. so, yeah, whether you call it sculpting or, or filtering or, redu or reducing or just focus, let's call it focus yeah. and economy. Yeah. You know, how you can say the most with the least is, has been my lifelong um, musical pursuit. What is the most effective thing you can do emotionally to bring about the experience you want the audience to have with the fewest, uh, fewest crayons. That's a great perspective. I like that. It's I, I didn't invent it. I didn't make it up. And I it's, don't it's think there's many people one. who don't no, have I, a variation of that. Nobody, nobody in my world thinks I am. I have the kitchen sink and stand back because this is going to be uh, a wild ride that you're not going to believe. Well, it's. You know, if, if, you, if you talk about pop production, there's the Phil Spectors of the world, but for the most part, the most, you know, most of the classical, the classic, rather, pop records are very sparse in Pretty terms sparse. of the elements. Sure. Yeah. I mean, the best hip hop yeah. is incredibly sparse. Even the um, Motown stuff, <clears throat> even. Well, like, even when you get down to it, Phil Spector you know, as, is, is a great example of somebody who brought a lot of, who heightened the level of production from everything that had been done and wasn't afraid to bring in an orchestra and a choir and three drummers. But ultimately, when you listen to those mixes, nothing takes away from the lead vocal. Mm -hmm. Nothing yeah. takes away from the lyrics. Nothing takes away from the from, song. From the, song. Yeah. the song, you know, and mm -hmm. it's the same... Uh, for us, we may, you know, you may do a, a scene with a lot of aleatoric, crazy uh, orchestral techniques, tremendous uh, synthetic sound design. At the end of the day, those may function as textures and concepts that will still not take away from the song of, of what focuses the audience's attention on, on a scene, mm -hmm. on a moment within a scene. It's fantastic. I love it. So let's not forget to um, tell people about your book. Do you want to talk about that? Let's I, talk well, I can about say that. a few things about yes. this. Um, so when I just got started, I mean, there's, a, there's a, a short history to this book. When I first got started as a composer, um, I was in my early 30s, and I'd been writing a column on music technology for a magazine called Keyboard Magazine. I remember it well. And so I wrote, I wrote, I, I became a monthly columnist. It was kind of a fluke, I'm not a writer. Um, but we, we started doing that. And eventually, my career started to move because when I started, I was mostly working in technology. I was programming synths and samples and drum machines for, for record producers, but mostly for film composers. So I have this long history over a period of years of working with other composers and writing about it. And I wrote about it in kind of a humorous style of, 
you know, something went pretty wrong and this is how we fixed it and, you know, saved the day. Mm -hmm. um, eventually, my career started moving towards me getting my own work. And for a long time, I continued to write these articles. And then, uh, at one point, a few years in, my publisher said, you know, we're getting into writing books. How would you feel if we took a bunch of your columns about these different jobs you have? Because each column was sort of like, I got hired to do a job. This is how I did it. This is how it turned out. This is what went wrong. This is how I fixed it. Mm -hmm. You know, here's a funny anecdote. And, you know, here's the lesson learned. Kind of little, a little structure. And um, they said, well, we want to make it into a book. So we, we did. I went, I picked out the articles. And then I was very unhappy. And I said, let me take the concept here and let me actually rewrite it. So in the early aughts, 20 years ago, wow. I, wrote, I wrote the first edition of The Real World. And it was from the perspective of somebody quite naive, which I was at the time. I, this was from the perspective of somebody learning on the job and struggling with all of the th pitfalls of what anything that can go wrong will go wrong. But part of your success is based on your resiliency to bounce back, deal with it, you know, deal with the, the problematic people you deal with, the technology failing you, whatever it is. Your ability to evolve. Your ability to evolve and to, to cope in mm -hmm. some cases, to be, sure. you know, honest. Yeah. Sometimes it's just about making it, you yep. know, getting to the finish line. You know, uh, failure isn't an option. Mm -hmm. So that was, that, was the, that was version one, and I was pretty happy with it. Ten years later, which is about ten years ago, they said, hey, you know, uh, your book has moved to a new publisher. We'd like you to brush it up. So during that time, so much had changed in the technology. Sure. Sinking picture was now digital. Um, the te working in the box was now kind of a norm. So the first book was kind of assumed a lot of external gear and uh, time code and videotape and, and all of that, the stuff that had come before. Uh, you know, before and in my early career, and then had gone much more, well, actually got easier. The, you know, the technology made working the picture easier. So the second book mostly was a, was a brush up on the technology, um, but was still about film and television. I hadn't done any game. I never, 10 years ago, I hadn't really scored any games seriously. And games were a lot different 10 years ago too. Um, they were already doing orchestral and it was already getting quite interactive mm. um, but I just wasn't a part of that that world I see. Um, so for this edition of the book I could no longer write from the perspective of somebody naive this book is everything I wished I knew when I got started but nobody would tell me or nobody could tell me combined with the fact that the world of being a composer has shifted radically in the last 10 years what it takes to be successful, what it takes to, what the skill set is for a, for a composer. You know, whether it's, do you have to learn to write? Do you have to write for orchestra? Do you have to write for synthesizers? Can, do you have to use a sequencer? Can you use paper and pencil? Do you have to know sampling? Do you have to come up with your own sounds? Do you have to be able to go, f can you, do you have to write in any style? Do you have to be able to write a Western and a sci-fi show? Or can you just be, can you be a specialist? Do you have to be a generalist? Can you be a specialist? These are all really interesting things that have shifted so radically in, in, in these last uh, few years. Uh, and the technology has changed. Plus, I got to interview. The book's filled with interviews. Some of them are my mentors, some of the people I really look up to. But, you know, this is one of the only books that I was able to get John Williams to sit down and talk and Hans Zimmer and Ludwig Göransson and, you know, Basil Polidorus, uh, who's since passed away. But now I have John Powell in here. I, I have Sarah Schachner. I have Will, Wilbur Roger. I have Wendy and Lisa from Princess Band. Who's who in that. Um, you know, I have people from the pop world, from the classical world, uh -huh. uh, from the traditional world, from the experimental world. A lot of Academy Award winners, Michael Giacchino is in the book now. Wow. Um, and I'd say three or four of them are just about video games. Jack Wall is in here, uh, who's the first person to write uh, an orchestral score for a video game. Um, so the exciting thing about this edition of the book is that it, it, it is from the perspective of somebody who's been through it, who's still in the game, 
it's still what I do for a living. Um, but it really gets into the weeds of what are the aesthetics, what is the art of it, what is the technology of it, and then to the, the, the realization that in order to thrive, you're a business person. You're, you, you are creating a brand, and the brand is you. And if you don't look out for yourself, it doesn't matter who else you have in your life, agents or managers or, or whatever, you have to look after yourself. And... Um, that's, that's what matters. So the joy of this, and this took me like almost three years. I, I didn't expect it to be such a kind of a page one rewrite. I almost changed the name of the book. Uh -huh. I, couldn't come up, um, I couldn't think of anything better, so we <laughs> kept the name of the book. But almost none of the original material is in there. Um, and you know, the, the first book was written in the first person. It was I did this and I did that. And there's a little bit of that in there. There's still anecdotes, a lot of anecdotes. I did this, but it really is, the book is now written for you, the reader. The book is really in the second person. And um, again, it's the book that I wish somebody had written when I got my start. And it would have saved a lot of pain, <laughs> a lot of heartache, a lot of misery, a lot of sleepless nights. Not all of them. I mean, everybody has to have their own experiences. Exactly. I mean, one of the things you've learned when and somebody says, well, how do you get started? The answer is no two people have gotten into this uh, job the same. And, um, and, and I think it's important to realize that there is no path that is the singular thing. You know, you don't go to, you know, college A and put together demo reel B and send it to director C. Right. That, that has worked on a few occasions, but there's, there's a lot of luck involved. It's pretty rare. There's a lot of putting yourself out there involved. There's a lot of risk taking. You know, you don't know me, but, um, you know, it's been pointed out to me that there are more composers now than ever who have gotten a start through something they did on social media, putting their music online, um, putting it out there, hey, this is, here's a link to my, mm -hmm. my, my demo reel. I hope you'll give it a listen. And, you know, I'm a big fan of yours, whatever it is. Um, you know, we're living in a world where anybody can hear anything from anybody for free, more or less. And anybody can create an opportunity to be mentored, which I think is another really great thing in that sense. You know, you've, it's, you you've, know, you've mentored a, no, a number of people and you've been mentored by a number of people. Absolutely. I would not have been able to succeed in my first jobs if I hadn't already spent years working with other composers, ghostwriting for them, doing you know, additional music, programming, being a fly on the wall, just seeing things go right, seeing things go wrong, understanding the, the sort of the psychology and, and politics of the director-composer relationship, Big one. how to handle conf conflict resolution, how to handle uh, communications, clarity, Misunderstandings tend to be, and assumptions tend to be the thing that makes most projects that go wrong go wrong. Um, so I'm really grateful that I had a few years under my belt before my first job to work through the kinks of my, my writing uh, ability, to learn how to write a little faster, to have a few years of pure criticism of people saying, Jeff, change this and see how much better it is. Take this out. Try mm -hmm. this, you know. Go half time here, try double time there, add this, to, you know, just to have people in my life who could listen and go, try this, as opposed to just reading about it alone or, or having a way of understanding it. That's, you know, and I have to say in my book, I think I have encapsulated 80 to 90 percent of all of that criticism that I got early on it starts to fall into these grooves. You come back to the same mistakes again and again and again. And as you start to recognize those mistakes, <clears throat> you know, I have always thought that the only thing that separates a really successful composer or a good composer from a not so good composer, I mean, there's no such thing as good music and bad music. There's right music and wrong music, but the one thing that differentiates a really good composer from a not so good composer is they know when they've written shit. 
<laughs> and that they'll go back. That without being, there's a difference between being self-critical and self-doubting. You can be a highly confident, you know, even cocky human being and say, you know, I'm not bad. I've been doing this for a while. But to say, you know what? In this scene, this part works and this part doesn't. And I'm just going to, I'm not even going to try to fix it. I'm going to throw it away and I'm going to go with a new idea. To have that level, and I don't even know if criticism is the, is the right word. I, you can call it self-criticism, but it's just self-awareness. It's just the ability to go, you know what? I, I, I went a little off the rails here. Let me, let me go back in and, and fix that. And you know, part of that final step of, of that reductive last step I mentioned, that's, that's just part of going, you know what? I'm gonna take a breath, and now when I listen back, I made some mistakes, I made some rookie mistakes, I'm gonna go back in and fix. Having that ability to be that, have that level of self-awareness or self-criticism, it, I think it's what separates the successful ones from the non. I think a lot of people, there's an enormous number of people who are capable of writing amazing film scores. An amazing number. And some will and some won't. And some will succeed and some will try and fail. And the reason that they fail will be quite a few different reasons. Some of it's luck. Same reason some people become successful. Mm -hmm. Some of it's luck. Timing. Uh, some of it's circumstantial. Mm -hmm. And part of it is how you learn on the job. Yes. And I think, you know, when you talk about self-awareness, it's a confidence level, too, in that you have to have the ability to let go of an idea. You know, ideas are cheap. It's what you do with them. And 100%. I think it's really important to be able to say, you know what, that was a great idea that I may use for something else sometime. Yeah, I but agree 100%. I yeah. agree 100%. I think of art as <clears throat> a series of rapid fire decisions that you can go back on and then contemplate <laughs> whether or not they were good decisions. Yes. I think it's important to kind of work a little quickly, you know, break things and you know, what is a work fast and break things? Mm -hmm. Because if you, if you agonize over every note, if you agonize over every bar, if you agonize over every four second chunk of, of a video game or, or, or a scene, you're gonna lose, you're gonna lose the overall uh, the big picture. picture. Yeah. So for me, there's a part of, of my process that says, once you kind of know where you're gonna go, where you wanna end up with this, get it, get it, get it in there. Mm -hmm. And then go back and refine it and think, well, there's a counterline here. Or that I can hold off this melody to here and let me pull these bars out and let me add a few extra bars so it has a chance to kind of take a breath before this idea comes through. So that refinement process can be 90% of the process. Uh -huh. um, but for me, this idea of, of working kind of quickly, making, making decisions and then asking yourself, was it the right decision? Was this the right decision? Was this the right decision? It's a, it's a more thoughtful process. In some cases, you may have made all the right decisions. There's well, a first time for everything. It's never happened to me, but I'm sure it happens to other people. It probably does, but you know, there's, there's that old saying about, you know, start ugly, but start. Yeah, you know. Yeah. You, 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 you learn now that <clears throat> scientists and historians are analyzing all those famous paintings from the past three or 400, 500 years are all these layers and they've painted yes. out. Some of yes. the most famous paintings in the world have people that have been painted out or added at the last second mm -hmm. or entire, you know, ha big chunks of the picture yeah. that changed you know, up until the last second. And so um, I, think, I think it's the same. I say to anybody who really wants to be successful and get into being a, a scoring composer is learn to listen to the people you're working with, but then learn to listen to yourself from the perspective of the per people you're working for. And ultimately, from the perspective of the audience. But my ability, if I sit and listen to a piece of music, it might be, I, I'll go, wow, it's such a clever tune, that's such a great, you know, I love that, you know, those harmonies and that chord 
progression or that, that little jump in the melody, I thought, you know, going up to the high note. Mm -hmm. But then I'll say, well, I know what my director wanted in this section. Did I accomplish that? Well, maybe I did, maybe I didn't. And if I'm the person sitting in the audience watching this for the first time, am I foreshadowing what's going to happen? Am I gilding the lily? Am I overriding? Am I being obvious? Am I being on the nose? You know, you have all these things. And it's all about the ability to have some, some amount of objectivity about your own output. It's really, it's, it's really challenging to have objectivity about your own stuff. It's the mark of a good artist to begin with, though, isn't it? I think it's the only mark of a good artist. Yeah, I would agree. Jeff Rona, thank you for being my guest. Daniel Keller, thank you for having me, for traipsing up to the woods here. And, um, and, and uh, I look forward to doing this again. It's been a pleasure. Agreed. Hey, I'm Daniel Keller. Don't forget to hit the subscribe button and join us each week for Insights and Sound.